Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. In my last video, I basically shared with you guys about the post-Cold War context and the new wars concept. We covered some important transformations that happened at the time. But what are the implications of those changes after the Cold War? What does it mean for security studies? This will be the main focus on this video. So stick around because we will look at how some authors defended that there should be a broadening of the agenda of security studies. So first, I want to introduce to you the traditional agenda. Knowledge of strategic studies used to be produced from within military academies, not from within universities. It was very operational, specific, technical knowledge. It was a moment that demanded this technical character. In the 20th century, we had total wars, the rise of nationalism and mass mobilization. It is a moment where society becomes so embedded in the reality of violence that we need to think about violence from the point of view of society. Thus, it begins to have the first specialists in strategic studies that are civilian and non-military. The academy helps a lot in the war effort. Part of this absolute mobilization in the war includes universities, which need to start generating tools to be used in war. Therefore, once the academy starts to associate itself in the world of defense, it definitely answers the university sphere. What marks this moment is the reflection on deterrence, which led to models that were much questioned later. In a way, the problem of deterrence, where we use the technology of war to avoid it, creates an incentive to arm themselves so much they create huge arsenals of great destruction. Thus, it is considered how this technology can be used by the enemy, how it can be stolen, and international agreements are created to deal with this scenario. They are beginning to realize that the security experience of other spaces around the globe does not necessarily reflect the security concerns of the American foreign policy agenda. Thus, they begin to reflect on what is happening on the periphery at that moment. Despite the reality of the Cold War, what is observed in the periphery is the multiplication of armed conflicts, but also an armed conflict of a particular nature, of low intensity. These are conflicts with irregular factors of insurgent groups of a guerrilla nature. In the periphery, we have a reality of violence in which the bipolarity itself translates into confrontation and great pressure on institutions. States, from the institutional point of view of government capacity and the projection of military power, cannot fulfill the role that the Americans demand. Americans pressure states to repress their resistance within the anti-communist discourse. On the periphery, polarity accelerates violence. This polarization comes from the top down and is very striking in Latin America. After the post-Cuban revolution, Latin America is on red alert for the U.S. Americans were unable to understand that they needed to observe the problem of the insurgency. They only created a counter-insurgency doctrine in the mid-70s, when the Vietnam War was going very badly. Up until that point, American academies had now reflected on irregular warfare. In the case of Latin America, these wars are influenced by the Cuban Revolution. The U.S. supported several military coups in that post-Cuban Revolution period. On the other hand, the Soviet Union also sees this process as a window of opportunity. Most insurgent groups are post-Cuban Revolution. Both the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia and the National Liberation Army were created after the 60s, and they were supported by the Soviet Union and also partially trained in Cuba. The reality of Latin America became even more polarized in the 60s and brings up the issue of the problem of national security. There is an idea of the predominance of the internal enemy rather than an external enemy. This is a very different security framework to the American one. The way the state apparatus thinks about the security problem is focused on fighting the internal enemy. This justifies a whole shift in military thinking. From the 60s onwards, polarization accelerated. On the periphery, this polarization translated into instability. In the relationship between the U.S. and the USSR, with MAD, political structures that were stable became unstable. This is clear in Latin America after the Cuban Revolution. In the 80s, there was a transition in Latin America, an erosion of authoritarian regimes and a tendency to have transition processes. We have a process where the alliance between the military regime and the economic elite that gives stability to that project started to fail because of the debt crisis that these countries were involved in. Thus, it has an important economic variable. There are the military plans for national development in which countries like Brazil grew in large percentages to the standard of what we are growing today. 
but this resulted in a huge debt. Thus, the relationship between the political elite, which controlled order, and the economic elite, which wanted a relationship between order and progress that was no longer happening, was weakened. Mechanisms had to be found in the 80s to make a transition, even before the Cold War began to draw to a close. The United States at that time was resuming the Cold War narrative with the Star Wars project, among other projects, while Latin America was moving away from that. In the European setting in the 50s, their security interests were dependent on American interests because it was Americans who financed the European reconstruction process. Furthermore, Europe was close to the USSR, becoming threatened. So in this decade, we see an overlap between the American security narrative and how Europeans think of their own security. This generates a dynamic of dependency. There's an important strategic element for Americans as when they come out of the Second World War, they are so big, they are close to an overproduction crisis. So they need new markets to observe this growth. In this way, it is necessary to finance the development and reconstruction of Europe. The 60s is a decade of this dynamic. When Europe rebuilds itself, it lacks people to work. So they look for these workers in the colonies that had just declared independence. In the 60s, European governments wanted immigration. The government needed these people. So what happens in this scenario is that the result of labor shortages produced by war efforts makes it necessary to have a large influx of migration. The important thing is to understand that the narrative is built around the anti-immigrant discourse born in this decade which is transformed into a discourse of insecurity. Thus, the concern is with the migrant problem and no longer with the problem of nuclear bombs. The aversion to immigrants was of an economic nature. In the 60s, there was a resentment of European groups that rejected the narrative of seeing Europe as the great villain of colonization. For them, it didn't make sense to integrate those people in Europe. The way in which European society dealt with the end of the colonial problem was not well resolved at the time. Therefore, there is a crack within the elite of these countries. One part sees that the colonial moment has passed, and if necessary, we must observe these people in Europe. For others, they don't accept it. They see communities that Europe helped to develop and that later resented the Europeans. So, they should not be absorbed into Europe. In the 50s, the American and European security problem was inseparable. For Americans, European security was part of the security narrative and vice versa. In the 80s, there was the return of the Cold War narrative, the war in Afghanistan, the Star Wars project, advances in military spending on research, and the expansion of armaments. In Europe, there is no follow-up to this resurgence of the narrative of bipolarity. There is a separation between the American and European security experience. Increasingly, as the Cold War unfolds, different spaces developed different security narratives. In the 80s, it was the key moment of this separation. So, the whole order building project that Americans engaged in in the 50s directly influences everything that happens in the rest of the world. They built the institutions that organize the economic and political security dynamics of other countries. U.S. security priorities put pressure on governments in other countries. Looking back at the 50s, the picture that the Academy of Strategic Studies is beginning to draw about the security dynamics of the international system seems to make sense. As the Cold War unfolds, different regions create other dynamics. The polarization produced by the Cold War is a factor of instability. This leads to the proliferation of armed groups, guerrillas, and insurgents within these countries. At the same time, in Europe, we have a situation in the 60s of prosperity due to the help of the Americans, who bet on incentives for migration from the ex-colonies, which encounters resistance from certain groups, but is implemented. In this, when the context turns to crisis, these groups that were not heard in the 60s start to become very vocal. These groups try to create an association between the entry of immigrants and unemployment. In the 60s, there was an excess of employment. In the 70s, there was the problem of unemployment. Thus, they built a xenophobic narrative. We have the idea that they were invaded by foreigners, as they are different in many aspects religion, habits, culture. This allows for a threat narrative from that foreigner. 
This only becomes more present after 9-11, but the debate is much older. From a security point of view, the important thing is that there is a new problem for Europeans as a result of this situation, which is related to the inability to have an effective response to the integration of these communities that were encouraged to migrate during the 60s. These communities have migrated, unemployment has returned, and there is a narrative of resistance to these people. This narrative is constructed as a threat to the security of Europe's survival. Thus, it is seen that in the 60s this was the great security concern in which institutions and measures to manage the migration problem were needed. In the 80s, Americans returned to the Cold War, Latin America was undergoing a process of democratic transition and Europeans were beginning to consolidate this migratory discourse. So we see three very different security frameworks. The end of the Cold War makes this obvious when bipolarity ends, but this issue has been there before. Thus, there is an idea that the sources of instability in the international system are not necessarily in the dynamics of military confrontation between two powers. This only becomes evident after the end of the Cold War, but it was noticed before that. On the periphery, clashes are not just between national entities as it was in the Cold War. Identity becomes very important. The relationship between the state and security involves the idea that the state is the structure that guarantees security from internal and external threats. Within the nation, there are no divisions. The resistance to the divisive narrative that there are privileged groups and other non-privileged ones is very strong. This element of unity is fundamental for nationalists. There is only one nation, one state. The role of the state is to defend that nation. If there are divisions, the state apparatus may be appropriate to prosecute some of the groups for the benefit of others. Thus, in the thinking of strategic studies, the state represents the nation and individuals. Thus, the state must be the provider of security. If we open the possibility of seeing the state as a threat to security, this is beyond the scope of what is being thought of by strategic studies. Some of these elements that were already present during the Cold War become determinants of the patterns of violence observed in the 90s and bring elements that challenge the discourse of realism. Initially, we can point out that there are sources of insecurity that are not of a military nature. For example, in the case of treating European immigration as a security discourse, the migration process that generated the context of insecurity in Europe is not a military process. Not only is it not a process generated in a military scope, it cannot be resolved by a military option either. Strategic thinking cannot deal from the point of view of these new transformations as they always thought of the panoply of the use of force, which is used to combat the enemy externally. For example, in the case of Latin America, we observe that the armed forces are used to fight the enemy internally. Also, we have another element. If we accept the fact that a nation has divisions, you open up the possibility that groups within the state can persecute other groups. For example, we have the humanitarian crisis in Darfur, where the government of Sudan put the army to pursue and train militias to exterminate certain groups. Thus, for some groups, the state is a source of insecurity. This is outside the conceptual register of strategic studies because the objective of these studies is to think about a state strategy. When we have a whole conceptual reality to understand the war between states and to make sense of this pattern of violence, all this rationality, all the set of efforts and dynamics in which they are involved, it is necessary to add variables that strategic studies are not accustomed to using. Thus, a group of academics decides to break with the traditional paradigm. It is not desired to discard strategic studies, but to understand the reality of security, it is necessary to expand what we mean by security. Traditionalists advocate the idea that in the complex international system, there are several important aspects. There is the climate, food security, migratory forces, human rights, among others. But that doesn't mean that treating all of this as a security problem will allow you to understand the reality of this phenomenon. For them, security is Stephen Walt's classic definition. It is the study of the use of the military apparatus. It is implied that this use is made by the state. That's what strategic studies say. These are the limits of the discipline. This traditional current has an emphasis that cannot be disengaged from the idea that the threat comes from military sources. What matters to them is that the threat has to do with changes in the military sphere, both from the point of view of the one who threatens as well as from the point of view of the one who is threatened. 
So if we study security, we look at the transformations in the adversary's military technological nature and what military technological choices you will need to make to manage the threat posed by changes in the adversary's military technological character. You don't give up on the premise that the state is the actor. Thinking about security is thinking about state security. Furthermore, it is important to emphasize that science does not depend on the author's subjectivity. It is necessary to demarcate the object of study and the method of analysis in order to measure knowledge against each other. For the traditional authors, we have three main aspects. The process is military, the state is an actor, and science is essential. For people who want to increase security, we have sources of threat that are not military sources. In the case of Europe, of course, since the immigration threat is not related to the military scope, there are variables that are not military in nature. Therefore, this relationship between state and nation is not so absolute. Some societies are not protected by the states. That's all. If you like this video, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Also, next week's video is about securitization theory. If you don't want to miss it, then hit the notification bell. Until next time, thanks for watching.